Praise the Lord. So I want to welcome our viewing audience on YouTube. I especially want to give a very special greeting to our brothers and sisters who are in covenant relationship with Pure Grace Ministries. Um, my son in the Lord, Pastor Joseph in Ghana, my precious brother, brother Pastor Eric in Western Kenya, and of course, our longtime friend, Pastor Ronald in Northern Kenya. We also want to greet Pastor Rajar in India, our brothers and sisters in Pakistan, and our precious brother Neil in the Philippines. And everyone else who comes to the website who have been fed and whose lives have been changed by our wonderful Savior who hung on that cross for us and is now risen and seated at the right hand of Majesty on high. So we want to welcome everyone. Today we're going to continue our series that we started last week on God at work in the dark. <clears throat> and some, you know, God is a God of light. He's not a God of darkness. But he does some of his best work in the dark. Because it just seems like the dark is the only place where we're not too busy running around trying to figure things out. You know, we can't go very far. When somebody shuts the light off, you kind of slow down a little bit so you don't end up running into things. Well, most people slow down a little bit. So, we want to continue what we left off last week. And we were talking about from chaos to clarity. When, you know, God said, let there be light, and it was light. We want to talk about how the world was in the form of just water, chaos, it was darkness. There was nothing, nothing very comely about the world, right? God created in the beginning the heavens and the earth. And then we find that in verse 2, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. We talked about how, without going into the details, you can watch the message on, on, uh, on YouTube, but how God did not create the world in the state that we find it in in Genesis 1-2, right? One of the misconceptions that the church has had is that God created the world in six days. God restored the world in six days. The word in the Hebrew, when he said that and the world was, was void and formless, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, it's a world that talks about chaos, talks about judgment, right? So we find the world in that state in Genesis 1-2. And in later verses, which I shared with you last week, it talked about how the God did not create the world in that state of turmoil. And the correlation is this. You were not created in a state of turmoil. Your God is a God of order. He's a God of light. And you are light because you're born of water and spirit. If you find yourself, and if you listen to this message online, and, you're, and your life is in a state of chaos, it's like that. Just one big block. Know, know that the Spirit of the Lord hovers over your life as He brooded over the earth. Unhappy with the condition and the state that the earth was in in verse 2. And He's there to begin the transformation process in your life. So we talked about how God said, let there be light and there was light. And God saw that the light was good and God divided the light from the darkness and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. So the first thing that God does when you find yourself, whether by your own decisions and your own errors and mistakes or whatever situation brought you into the state that you find yourself in, sometimes it's the enemy's attack on your life. Sometimes, you know, we make foolish mistakes and we find ourselves in a place, in a pit, right? Like Pastor Sharon shared on Friday. Elijah ran from God, ran from everything, found himself in a cave in a place of darkness. And the Lord called Elijah out of the darkness into the light and then said, what are you doing here? See, when he asked you, what are you doing here? And he rehearsed his whole problem and all his stuff. Twice. God is not going to give you the next step in the next direction in your life like with Elijah until you step out of the darkness. Until you step out. It's a choice. We were not created in a state of pity and despair and despondency and depression. We find ourselves there because of things that happen to us or that are done to us by people. God is never the author of those things. But He will use those things to bring about change and to bring out transformation in your life. Because just like with the world, He did not create it in a state of chaos. So they wanted to restore it. Now, God could have done like that, <clears throat> and 
and everything could have been restored to what it was. But he didn't do that. He took six full days to restore the world back into its state of order. I'm reminded of that verse that says, A bruised reed will he not break, and a smoldering flax he will not quench, until he's transformed judgment into victory. The world is in a state of judgment. Many theologians and Bible scholars believe, and I'm in agreement with them, that the reason why the world found itself in the state that, is, that it was in, in Genesis 1-2, was at Lucifer's fall. And Isaiah 14 talks about how Lucifer fell. How thou hast fallen, O Lucifer, son of the morning, how thou who didst weaken the nations. And that's a whole other message. What nations is Isaiah talking about? What was here before? <clears throat> that's for another day. All I can tell you is he fell. There was a war. He drew a third of the angels of heaven. Michael and his angels fought with him. There'll be another battle in Revelations again. When Right now, he's called the prince of the power of the air. The misconception is that demons are in hell tormenting people. It is myth. That's where they're going to go. So they're not there. They're running around in the heavenly realms. Remember, we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities and powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world, and spiritual wickedness in high places. So they're floating around out there, causing trouble. And one day, Michael's going to show up with the two-thirds of the angels that stayed loyal to God, and they're going to take Lucifer and his angels and cast them to earth. And the world will be surrounded in an angelic wall that they cannot penetrate. But we're not there yet. We're still in the grace. The light of the world is still upon us. While we're here, there is still light. But when we pull out of here, there will be a darkness that will fall upon this world like it has not been seen since that day. Right? So judgment brought the world... I mean, you've got to imagine, you think of Star Wars, like this was a battle that took place over the whole of creation. And the, all the universe was thrown out of life. And the devil was hurled down, cast out of heaven. Right? Now... You and I can never be cast out of heaven because we are children of light. The light is within us. God himself dwells inside of us. Right? So the spirit hovered, unhappy if you remember in the Hebrew, in the state in which the world found itself in. The first thing that God did was said, let there be light. And it was light. Now I want you to know, that is not the sun that started shining. Because later on, he creates the sun and the moon. So what light was this? I submit to you is the light of Jesus. He says, I am the light of the world. He who walks in me will not walk in darkness. One translation says. He made that light. That is a supernatural light that cannot be extinguished. And he made a separation between the day and the night. We are the children of the day, not of the night. Not of the night. The night is as the day to the Lord because he sees further, farther, and deeper than anyone can see. And he made that distinction, and he saw that the light was good. And that word good in the Hebrew means it was a happy, it was delightful. Light. The supremacy of Jesus supersedes any other created light. God made a distinction between his light and the darkness in which the world found itself in. So, when we talk about God at work in the dark, you're in that place of uh, void and formless and, you know, one day seems to blend into another day. I've been there. I, I have struggled with depression in my life, and I know what that's like. You just, one day just flows into the next, flows into this, and it's not a good thing. Whether it's the sun is shining or raining, or what, and you're in, you got clouds covering you. And the Spirit of the Lord came, and the first thing that comes is the light of Jesus into your situation. Like Elijah. Elijah, what are you doing here? And it was Joaquin, why are you doing here, my son? You are a child of light, not of darkness. Step out of that cave of depression and come and join me in the light. There's that light. It's the supremacy, the light that's shown throughout well, everywhere. I mean, it was such a powerful light. It was the presence of God. Light is the first thing that's restored. When you're in a state of depression and despair and despondency, the first thing God does is show up and boom, I am He. I am that I am. I am Jesus who hung on that cross for you and paid for your sins. Get up out of that cave. What are you doing in that cave? And it's not a judgmental voice. It is a loving voice. It's a soothing voice that calls you. That calls you out of that place. And what did God do? He enjoyed the light. 
and it was evening and morning the first day. So the first day, as I see a transition back into the place of light, to the place that God created you to be, is the light of the world, which is Jesus, to shine a brightly. There's a revelation that you may fight it, but there's this powerful revelation that says, what are you doing here? This is not what you're supposed to be. If you've ever had dreams and they've been broken, if you've ever been disappointed, there is something inside of you that says, this isn't supposed to be this way. When you're sad and you're wounded, something inside of you says, I was built for more than this. I was born for more than this. You don't understand how you got into this mess, but you know intrinsically that you, there's more to your life than just going to work or going to school or doing whatever it is you do. There's something inside of you that says you were more. But of course, Paul said, no, you're not, that you're the temple of the Holy Spirit, for the Holy Spirit dwells within you. Of course, the one who hovered over the world and restored it back to the place it's supposed to be is the one that dwells inside of you. So if you are not fulfilling the purpose for which God made you, the Holy Spirit is not happy. That's the same word used when he grew you. Unhappy by the condition in which the world found itself in. Why? Because he knew God had made the... See, during the restoration we have the Garden of Eden. <clears throat> Isaiah talks about the earth itself was the garden. It was Eden, the Garden of God. The whole planet was in Eden. When he restored it, he planted the Garden of so imagine the whole planet was Eden. And one day it will be that way in Revelations. When the Father brings His throne room to earth and rules the whole of creation from the planet earth, the sun will no longer give His light nor the moon. There won't even be any seas. There will be a river that will flow from the throne room of God. And wherever that river flows, it brings life. That is your Father. Anything less than you walking in the fullness of what God intended for you, you will not be happy. But the, our problem is, is that we try to figure out what that is on our own. Samuel told Saul, Has the Lord as great delight in sacrifice, and that you hearken unto the voice of the Lord? For to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken in the fat of rams. Jesus died and fulfilled. We have two crosses, by the way, if you're watching this online, on both sides. He fulfilled God's purposes and the obligation of the law on your behalf. And paid the punishment for your sins. For you. Your substitute. So on this side of the cross, obedience is yielding to the Holy Spirit. Paul talks about not grieving the Holy Spirit of God from which you have been sealed into the day of redemption. That day of redemption is not that someday you're going to be saved. You're saved. The day of redemption is what's, in, what's outside of you looks exactly like what's inside of you. That's the promise. One day you're going to have a body that actually matches what your spirit looks like to God. It'll never go hungry, it'll never go tired, it'll go right through the ceiling. And you will meet your Father, your Lord, I should say, in the air. And you shall be with Him always. He loves you. He is passionate about you. But we need to yield to that plan, and sometimes that plan is going to take us through some dark valleys. But the light of the world is in us. So we never walk in darkness. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The word of the Lord. The word of the Lord is Jesus. Jesus is the word made flesh. So we, he is the light as well as his written word, his logos. We talked about the difference between logos and rima. Logos is the written word of God. Rima is the inspiration of that written word spoken to you that you receive. The Spirit in the Old Testament talks about, and you will have need that no one teach you, but the Lord Himself will be your teacher. Amen. That is new covenant. I'm here to preach the word to you, but the Spirit of grace that is in you will instruct you as I preach to you. We have one Lord and one shepherd. Yes, one shepherd. Many of you know, when you see my signature block and the emails I sent out, it says, Lead sheep and senior pastor. I am a sheep also. The problem that many pastors face is that they think that you graduate from being a sheep to being a shepherd and you're no longer a sheep. Sorry, brothers. doesn't work that way. David said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He causes me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, 
take comfort. You want to reach the fullness of God, whether you're a pastor or a lay person, it doesn't matter. You need to learn how to be a sheep. A sheep is dependent on their shepherd. And we were never intended to live in darkness. The light of Christ shines in you. So that's the first thing, that's the first revelation that hits us in that situation. Is somehow, some way, God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit make a direct manifestation of light into your situation. Unfortunately, many Christians have that experience and they ignore it. They are so wrapped up in misery that they fail to see the light that is shining at them. The keys of death and hell are in Jesus' hands. So the notion that God is going around killing people is unscriptural on this side of the cross. Okay? He has the victory over death. Right? But you got to want to live. Right, Pastor Joe? When you believe this confession of faith, Caleb, right? And he's not even as old as Caleb yet. Although he runs around, he has more energy than all of us put together. <clears throat> but when you want to live, God is the author of life. He'll give you life and He'll sustain you. And you know, I believe the Lord's coming is soon. When? I have no idea. He can come at any time. Mm -hmm. But what keeps Him from coming is His heart of compassion for all the lost. And for His sheep who have strayed, and he goes after each and every one. Mm -hmm. I was one of them. And he came after me in the army. Got my attention and brought me home. That is his heart. Chaos, confusion, despair, despondency is not the state in which you were intended to live. Mm -hmm. Scrapping by to get through, living paycheck to paycheck, that is not God's will for you. And if you're there now, you're passing through. That is not the zip code in which you live. But you've got to get this revelation of the light of God, that I am your life. I am that I am. I am the King of kings and Lord of lords. Where God becomes your shepherd. Hey, this is your problem, your responsibility. I belong to you. Right? But we need to have patience, have its perfect work, Peter said, that you may be perfect and wanting nothing. Patience is the key. And the only way you're going to be patient is by knowing that God is good. You can't listen to the lies of the devil telling you, oh, you're lost, you're no good, you're a loser. If you're listening to this online, you, this is a divine appointment for you. God has a word of life for you, for you to hear his words and come out of that darkness into the glorious light for which you were birthed into. That is the state. So we have light for that first day. We have that sense of Jesus, I am a child of God. And all of a sudden, that light overcomes all of the darkness. There is no darkness that can overcome the light of God. None. Absolutely not. So then now, we go, we find this thing in the state of the world. Now, it's one big, giant bowl of water, and there's light now. Not from the sun, but from the presence of God Himself. A light that permeates, I believe, throughout all creation. It was a light that was, could be seen anywhere and everywhere. So we see, and God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. He made a distinction between himself and what is not. Okay? This thing that, you know, we're not on God's side. He's on our side. Okay? We are his, and he is ours. We belong to him, and he belongs to us. He's our father, and he loves us. And there's a distinction between light and darkness. When you start getting in the revelation of the presence of God and the light of Jesus, you're going to be able to all of a sudden start distinguishing between what's satanic and what is heavenly. You'll be like, you'll begin to get a sense of, you know what, I'm not supposed to be in this mess. This isn't right. I shouldn't be here. And then it's like, Lord, I don't know how I got here, but I need you to get me out. And he'll lead you out. It's not beam me up, Scotty. It's a process. Why? I believe it's a process because God does not want you to go back into that place of darkness again. He doesn't. Elijah is a perfect example. From the highest point in his natural ministry, he fell to his darkest point. And from his darkest point, wanting to die, God exalted him to a point that he never dreamt of. When he sent the fiery chariot and took him to heaven. And right now, he's standing in the presence of God. Him and Moses. A lot of people think Moses died. Moses did die, but God brought him back to life. 
because or else a ghost was talking to Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. And we know that the Bible says, because when Jesus was on earth, the law was in full effect. We're not supposed to traffic with spirits. That means that was really Moses standing on that mountain with Elijah. He got promoted and exalted. You see, Moses, in the sense of Elijah, he's in a cave. So as long as you stay in your cave, you cannot go out and fulfill your destiny. Right. And you cannot appoint the next one to follow you. His successor was Elijah. Had he stayed in that cave, Elijah would have never been anointed and would have never had the ministry that he had. He had to take a step out of that cave. Mm -hmm. And then the Lord said, go and anoint this one, the king of Syria. Go and anoint this one, the king of, of Israel. Go and appoint your successor, Elijah. Got to get out of that cave. But now you have the light, and the light is leading you out of that cave. So now you're out of the cave. God saw that the light was good. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. One full day passed where God admired his handiwork. God is not in a hurry, and neither should you be. This is why we need patience, folks. You need patience because patience allows God to do his perfect work in your life. In your life. In your life. It allows God to work at a very precise and determined way. He's not in a hurry. You know how I come I know he's not in a hurry? Not only because we see this through the restoration of creation, but Jesus came to earth. How? He didn't just appear in the scene like a full-blown man. He was conceived of the Holy Spirit in Mary's womb. Mary carried him for nine months in darkness. Okay? This is 24 hours. Nine months in, his, in Mary's womb. Then he was born just like a normal child, put in a trough where animals eat, under the most humble of conditions. And who was invited to his birth? Not kings, not priests, lowly shepherds. He grew in obscurity. We only have one reference when he was 12 years old. Then we don't hear from him until he's 30. Mm -hmm. So think about that. Jesus once said, no servant is greater than his master. So if he went through that, don't be surprised if you're waiting. You're waiting because God is fulfilling his purposes in you. He's building the new, in you the character. How does your seed grow? In the ground. Where no one can see it. That's where the root system grows. And then it starts to grow out of the ground. So what God teaches you in the dark and what he works in you is character in the dark so that your fruit and your harvest is in the light. So if you're in that cave, come out of that cave because your harvest is in the light, not in the dark. Maturity occurs in the dark. When you go through difficult times and trials and testings and difficulties, that's where you mature because that's where you learn to trust the Lord. It's very easy to say, God is my provider. When you got money in the bank. When you got a job and you have perfect health. But if you're still saying those things and you're in the dark, you're in that valley like David was, and you're still shouting, when you get on that mountaintop, your shout will shake the earth. Dr. Charles Stanley once said, oh, over 20 years ago, I remember him saying this. He said, a faith that hasn't been tested is a faith that cannot be trusted. Most of the times, oftentimes, I think what happens with many pastors and ministers and leaders that fall in situations, public ministries, is because they've never gone through any periods of darkness in their own life. Never gone, never known how, what it means to work for somebody, for a nasty boss who's never pleased, having to show up at a particular time and doing certain things. See, Pastor Sharon and I have worked in the workforce. I had a 20-year banking career. She was in journalism and marketing. We know. So you can have compassion on people who are coming from work to come to church on a Friday night to be like, you know what, we need to end on time. Because just because they're here doesn't mean they want to be here for five or six hours. <laughs> right? Do unto others as you would have done unto you. That is the heart of God. See, God can handle anything. But He knows that we can handle everything. Mm -hmm. So He's very deliberate and very patient in what He does. So today we're going to talk about separating the life from above and the life from below. There is a life. There's, there's life that's a heavenly life and there's an earthly life. Mm -hmm. You are an interesting enigma. We all are, I should say, because I'm, it's not like I'm, I've obtained. We have a heavenly life that's eternal, that dwells within us. Our spirit is eternal. 
Actually, every man's spirit is eternal, but they're either going to heaven or they're going to go to hell, depending on if they've accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. But you specifically, as a child of God, you have the heavenly seed within you. The seed of the kingdom is inside of you. It is incorruptible, immutable, unchangeable. It, it, la it will last forever in heaven where you belong because you're born of water and spirit. So the kingdom of heaven is yours. Your home is in heaven. Your father is in heaven. That's the, you. But you live in your earthen vessel. Your old man is dead and a new man has been born in the same old body. And that's why we sometimes struggle with you know, add anger and all of this stuff because our emotions are tied to our body. Our brain is flesh. But your soul, the spirit, you're, you're a spirit and you have a soul. The soul is the seat of your emotions, your intellect, and it sits in your brain. And that's why you heard me talk about you got to watch what you meditate on. Because whatever you stick, stick in your head will seep into your heart and that's what's going to come out of your mouth. Right? So... Now you have the light. You've been in the darkness and now God gives you light and you, you see that, wow, you know, I, I shouldn't be here. Something's wrong here. But now we need to start separating between your heavenly life and your earthly life. God cares about both. But God is more concerned about your inner man than your outer man. God always does healing from within and then it manifests itself out. See, a lot of people come to God for physical healing, but they're not interested in letting go of their anger. And their attitudes and their problems and their, you know, whatever. No, no. God wants to mend your broken heart, restore your mind and your soul into a bright health so that your physical body can do it. The scripture says, a merry heart to a good like medicine, but a broken spirit dries the bone. So if your spirit is broken, you're going to have infirmities. They're going to stick to you like lint on a wool suit. So God wants to deal with that broken heart first. And he can't, and so he works in the dark to draw you out of the dark into the light. Get out of that cave. That's not where you're supposed to be. That's not where you're supposed to be. So that's what we're going to talk today about that. So there is a distinction that happens. The scripture says, And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. So you got everything in there. Water speaks of life. Right? Because we can go without eating for a while, but if you go without drinking for a few days, you're done. Right? So water is very important for our life. Right? So water speaks of life. It speaks of refreshment. It also speaks of, you know, wisdom. Right? You drink, you, you get. So if, if you drink something that's contaminated, it's going to affect your whole body. If you listen to a message or you go to a, a church that preaches a mixture of law and grace, you're contaminated. Mm -hmm. You're going to think God is good some days and God is not so good some other days. God is good all the time. We're the ones that shift. He never shifts. There you go. So there's a separation. There's, there's a, a, you know, okay, now by his, you're going to start separating and you're going to start seeing that there, I have a life that's from above that's spiritual. And then I have an earthly life. And God is concerned about both, but he's more concerned about your spiritual life than he is about your physical life. He cares about both, but he understands that what happens is you need to know that, hey, you know what, I belong up there, but I'm here on earth. God dwells within me. The spirit of grace is within me. I am a child of God. I have been purchased by the blood of Jesus. So ain't nothing going to touch me without going through him first. You start to see that. Then there becomes a distinction. Your mind, where now is cluttered and it was just a mishmash. So that water all being together is like your, your, your spiritual life and your earthly life will come in with. Now that you have a clear understanding of who you are in Christ, it opens the door for there to be a separation of the wisdom that's above and the wisdom that's below. Because the wisdom that's from above is first pure, peaceable, easily to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruit, right? right? Without partiality and without hypocrisy. You start to think from a different perspective. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. So if you're weak, I submit to you, you're not waiting biblically. Because waiting shouldn't weary you, it should strengthen you. They shall mount up on wings as eagles, and how eagles fly very high. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. 
That is waiting on God. But how do you wait? When you know in your heart that God is good. Like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego told Nebuchadnezzar, you know what, O king? Our God is able to deliver us out of your hand, and we know that he will. But even if he doesn't, we will not bow down to your gods nor to your idols. Sometimes you've got to draw a line in the sand that says, Devil, I am not crossing that line. I don't care what you say, I know my father. Oh, but what about if this happens? You know what? I'd rather sink in a boat that Jesus is in than to stand on the shore without him. That's a faith that can't be shaken. Remember what I shared a couple of weeks ago. Unshakable, unbreakable, unmovable. When you know your God, the scripture says the people that know their God shall do exploits because of that cross. There's no one on that cross anymore and there's an empty grave in Israel. He is seated at the right hand of majesty on high. At the seat of power and you are in Christ. So when the world can touch you? But we need to remind ourselves and rehearse these things because these are not things that are going to happen naturally. The word separated means to divide. God steps in and begins to divide His wisdom that's heavenly, that's pure, pleasant, peaceable, between what the world tells you. Right? You go to a doctor, they give you a report, oh, you know, blah, 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 blah. You sit there and you're like, nod your head and you say, Lord, this is yours. Right. And if they say, well, you know, why are you staring at me like that? I said, you know why? Because I'm talking to my father in heaven. I hear what you're saying, but I know what he said. So, you know what, brother? I mean, doctor, you know, tell me how much your co-pay is so I can get on my, along my way and get on my prayer list with my church because I'm not accepting this report. Now, it doesn't mean you take your medication and flush it down the toilet. Thank God for doctors. Right? I said this many years ago, uh, and a couple of years ago when we started the church. You have to find the place where you have faith to stand and stand on that. Yeah. Even if it's the size of a poster stand. Because the only faith you need is the size of a mustard seed. Mm -hmm. And we talked about in that series that that mustard seed is the kingdom. If the kingdom of God is this much in you, you can say to a mountain, be removed. Amen. Remember, Paul said, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. For Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave his life to me. It's no longer your faith, it's his faith. Because you are of his flesh and of his bones. See, what the enemy tries to do is to isolate you. How do predators attack prey in the wild? They separate them from the pack. So if you've been separated, if you listen to this message online and you've been hurt by the church, on the behalf of of the Lord Himself, I am so sorry that you have gone through this. But don't isolate yourself from the body of Christ. Find a place. Pray for God to find your place where you could be fitly joined together. I promise you that Pure Grace Ministries is not the only church on the planet that believes these things. God always reserves for Himself a remnant. And we are grateful to be part of that remnant. And we know that our brothers and sisters pastors and leaders across the planet that we are in covenant relationship with that believe as we do. Our God is good and He will pursue you to the ends of the earth to bring you back to Himself. So wherever you are, stop and let Him bring you home. And we pray that God will find you a place where you can be fitted, where you can be loved and you can be cherished. Because it is all about you. It's not about myself or Pastor Sharon or Pastor Terry, Pastor Joe, Elder Larry or Pastor Eddie or any of the leaders here. It is about you. We will call to minister to you. We will call to lift you up. We will call to have you find your purpose in the body of Christ. It's not about us. That is true biblical leadership. That's what Jesus came. Jesus laid down his life for us that we might have life. And you were not appointed to live in turmoil. God will separate and begin to show you that, you know what? The world has a way of doing things, but this is the way of life. Set your thoughts on things above and not on things of the earth, where Christ sits. For you are dead and your life is hidden in Christ. You're not going to find who you truly are until you find who you are in Christ. Yeah. Because that's where your life begins mm -hmm. and has its finality. Amen? And so, we see that God said, and God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. So in that midst, in that word in the midst, he's severed. There's a severing that happens between 
the heavenly life and the earthly life. God knows you're on earth and you're in the flesh. But what did he say? Give no thought for your life. That word zoe, physical, fleshly life. Don't worry about it. Look at the birds. Look at the grass of the field, the flowers of the field. And, no, and your father feeds the birds and clothes the grass. And you are much more valued to him than these things. But you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. So what is the kingdom of God? Because we need to know that. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Your life is in the Holy Ghost. It's not in your flesh, not in your job, not in your kids, not in your spouse. It is in the Holy Ghost. Righteousness is a gift imputed from, by His sacrifice on the cross. Peace is shalom, which covers not only just peace of mind, but health, provision, deliverance. Again, another gift. Joy is the byproduct of you knowing that you're saved. That Jesus died for you. It should produce joy. Because the joy of the Lord is your strength. That God rejoices over you should strengthen you. No matter where you are, you're still in that cave and you're making those steps to get out of that cave, your Father is with you. Your Father is with you. And so, and God called the firmament heaven and the evening and the morning were the second day. So the first day you have a light and a revelation of who you are in Christ and who God is. He is your light. He is your direction. Then there's a separation between your heavenly life and your earthly life. Your sources of where you drink. you got to be careful where you drink. Because not all water is pure water. Mm -hmm. Not everything, not everybody that says they preach the gospel actually preach the gospel. If you walk away from a message that makes you feel dirty, you did not hear the words of life. That is not good news. That's what the, listen, the world can give you better news sometimes than the church can, sadly. It should, these things ought not to be, Paul said. You should walk out of a church service feeling loved. Amen. Feeling like God put his arms around you and embraced you. Mm -hmm. And said, you know what, I got this. It's taken care of. Trust me. It shall be well. You know, the interesting thing about water is that the water, that word in the Greek, is, is means water, but it also means juice, which is sweet. It also means, believe it or not, urine and semen. And what is semen? It brings life. So, that word, the water that we're talking about is water, but it also means life. It's where are you drinking from? Where is your source of life? Because whatever you drink, it will reproduce in you. If you drink life, it will reproduce life in you. If you drink a, some kind of weird mixture where God loves me some of the time, but if I don't say five our fathers and confess my sins before I go to bed, I'm going to go to hell, that, that's what it's going to produce in me. In order for you to stand in the dark, you have to be able to stand on ground that is secure. When you know that you're loved, it will keep you from falling. And Peter talked about that. He said it will keep you from falling and save you to the uttermost. Not the salvation of your, of your spirit, and your soul, your mind will save you to the uttermost. Things will get thrown in your way and you're going to embrace the truth. You're going to say, you know what, that's not who my father is. That's not who I am. Grace is never an excuse to sin. It's never a license to sin. It helps you to stand in spite of whatever's coming your way. And to know that if you fall, you can get up. In the scripture it says, though a righteous man falls seven times, seven times he gets back up again. Mm -hmm. In order for you to get up off that floor, you have to know that you're still righteous because of the blood that was shed. Amen. Amen. So if you fall into sin, you get up. Amen. Don't go, you know, this is how the Lord put it to me one way. When you stand, stand humbly. And meekly. Mm -hmm. And when you fall, get up boldly. Mm -hmm. Right? You fall, you get up boldly in the blood of Jesus and say, Thank you, Lord, that my Jesus, sin, this, right. this transgression has been washed and paid for on the blood on the cross. Mm -hmm. And I get up, and by your power, I keep walk, running my race. Yes. That is that distinction that happens mm -hmm. when the waters are separated. Because now you start drinking from your heavenly water that will give life to your physical body here on earth. Yes, keep going to doctors. If they tell you to take medication, take it. Pray over your medication. Say, Lord, keep me from any side effects. Amen. 
until such a time as he, he is still a healer. Don't get fixated on, well, you know, God's what to heal me. And I'm not going to take this medication. You know, you need to do what you have peace to do. And many precious people, I've known some who died because they stopped taking their medication because somebody told them they had no organs. And my thing is, if you've got new organs, there's one easy way to find that out. Go to a doctor and have them run some tests. Right. Simple as that. Don't get caught up in that. You keep focusing on your heavenly Father. You keep focusing on that heavenly life. You keep reading this word and ask the Holy Spirit to give you a revelation of who you are in Christ and walk and stand in that word. Because part of the armor of God is your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. If you still think God is angry with you, there's no peace in that. But when you know that all your sins have been forgiven, and as far as the east is from the west, that's how far he's removed your transgressions from you, then you can stand. Because he's no longer angry with you. I have loved you with an everlasting love, God, he said. And then you stand on that, and then you continue to walk. And you say, Lord, you know what? <clears throat> Heal me in those areas. I used to be a very, very angry person. I had no idea why I was angry. And I yielded to it, and one day I wasn't angry anymore. I had a disease that was incurable. The doctor said, sorry, you got nothing for you. And I prayed, and I asked God, what's going on? You know what he said to me? Many of you know this. Because you don't believe that you have been fully justified by the blood of my son. Let me tell you something. Condemnation will rob the life out of you mm -hmm. and send you to an early grave. Mm -hmm. Don't let anybody convict you and condemn you of something that Christ already paid for on the cross. Amen. But don't stay in that place. Get up. Yeah. Come out of the darkness. Okay. Come out of the cave. Mm -hmm. Because God loves you. The wisdom is from above. Everything that God has for you, it is a wisdom that brings you peace. It is loving. It is pure. It's gentle at all times. Mm -hmm. It will produce in you a yielding to others full of mercy, full of good deeds, shows no favor, turns in, and always sincere. God loves you. God no longer has any desire to condemn you. He already condemned his son in your behalf. Yes. So why should you walk under a cloud and be in a cave? Come out of the cave and join us in the light. None of us are perfect, but we know we are perfectly loved. Yes. We know that the blood that was shed for us was a perfect blood. Amen a perfect sacrifice, and we stand in that sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for your words of life. We thank you for your life-giving words. Lord, we drink deeply of the waters of heaven. We drink deeply of the life of heaven. May it grow in us. May it mature in us. May we grow into the full stature of sons and daughters of God. Father, we, we thank you for your love. We will forever be grateful for what you did for us. And Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters, wherever they are right now, that are watching this message, that are in a dark place, that are struggling with depression, that have been wounded by the body, by the church. Father, heal them. Yes. God is not done with you, my brother, my yes. sister. Yes. He has a good future for you. Yes. I know the thoughts and the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. They're plans for good and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. There is the best is yet to come, as Pastor Joe always says. Yeah. Don't give heart. Don't give up. Don't let your heart be broken. Mm -hmm. And don't be in despair, precious one. God loves you. God is right there with you right now as you listen to this message. Yes. And He is touching you and He has healed you. And He will usher you into His glorious light. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Thank you, Lord.